Seed. Farathorn. Yeah, uh, no, I'm not pronouncing it like that for an hour straight. For this video, we're going with how most fans pronounce it, which is Farathorn, not Farathorn. Blah. All right, here we go. Presenting another false white gaming film, Farathorn's Tangle, a seven hour Hungarian epic directed by Bella Tyranitar. Today, we're finally going over Farathorn, first introduced in Pokemon Black and White. Farathorn is unofficially the reason most Pokemon players are familiar with what a durian plant is, and is undoubtedly a massive help to anyone who has ever had to remember what the word Ferris means. Its thorny pods would also definitely give a new meaning to pod racing if it were ever to appear in a Star Wars prequel. Today, we're going to examine how Ferrothorn performed in the competitive scene. Were its metal spikes as piercing as they appear, or does its flattened look really tell the story? We find out today because we finally ask, how great was Ferrothorn actually? Oh man, buckle up because we got what is basically a feature length film ahead of us, and I know I'm fiending for more films after exhausting the catalog on my US Netflix. If only I could just obtain more content. Oh wait, I can, because this biopic is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is an app and browser extension that allows you to place your computer or phone virtually in any country as if you're actually there. Surfshark has 3200 plus servers in 65 countries. And by using Surfshark to connect to servers in other countries, you can get access to content that is normally region locked. For example, something I used it for was to rewatch every single Spider-Man live action film, yes, even those two, to maximize my future Spider-Man No Way Home experience. Unfortunately, when I searched it on Netflix and Disney Plus in the US, both Toby and Andrew's films were nowhere to be found. Thanks to Surfshark VPN, I'm able to simply connect to a server in Canada to watch Canadian Netflix, which for some reason has every single Spider-Man live action films. Of course, being a VPN, Surfshark encrypts your data and keeps it safe when connected to it, no matter where you are. This comes especially handy when connecting to public Wi-Fi. Surfshark Shark is also the only VPN service to let you use one account on unlimited devices, which is quite nice since I now have it on my phone, my tablet, my laptop, and both of my editing computers. So if you want a sick VPN and also support the channel to help us produce more content, you can use my promo code FALSEWIPE and get Surfshark VPN at 83% off and three extra months for free. And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Ferrothorn was instantly one of the best new Pokemon introduced by Generation 5 ever since day one and never missed the step. Its unprecedented typing was incredible, packing a plethora of crucial rarely seen together resistances. Being able to answer both water and dragon moves was nearly non-existent before, but here Ferrothorn was. It also packed an incredible electric resistance and, just as importantly, a neutrality to ice, making it the most perfect water type counter ever designed dominating the likes of Starmie and Gyarados in ways no Pokemon had before. Additionally, it boasted the achievement of almost single-handedly knocking Suicune, previously a three-time OU Titan, down to UU for the first time. Ferrothorn being a defensive steel that was neutral to Earthquake was incredible as well, and being a defensive grass neutral to Flying and Bug had lots of use too. The two typings just complemented each other perfectly. Ferrothorn wasn't going to be easy to wear down passively either, thanks to its incredible incredible immunity to Sandstorm, Toxic, and Leech Seed, as well as its Stealth Rock Resistance. That same Rock Resistance allowed it to shrug off powerful Stone Edges, and it was afforded an amazing resistance to Dark as well, letting it take both Choice Band and Tyranitar stab moves with ease. These resists were complemented perfectly by its incredible bulk and support move pool. Ferrothorn easily switched into several of the scariest moves in the game, from Draco Meteors to Rain Boosted Hydro Pumps, and proceeded to do whatever its team needed, which usually involved irritating the Daylight out of the opponent. It could get up Stealth Rock, it could easily stack multiple layers of spikes, it could weaken the opponents while keeping itself healthy with Leech Seed, potentially accentuated by Protect, it could even spread Paralysis with Thunder Wave. Ferrothorn was no weak passive wall either, with a great base attack stat and two high-powered stabs with useful coverage and Power Whip and Gyro Ball, Ferrothorn could hit back and hit back hard. Additionally, 
thanks to its amazing ability iron barbs it could even play offense while on defense it was able to punish moves like u-turn and rapid spin beautifully sometimes even choosing to take it one step further by holding a rocky helmet though it usually enjoyed the longevity of leftovers recovery ferrothorn was a big reason why spikes teams didn't need to run a ghost type for rapid spin protection nearly as much as in the previous generation sure it hurt that the rotom appliances were no longer ghost type but it almost didn't matter as ferrothorn completely dominated the previous best spinner around starmie and with iron barbs chipped it for even attempting to spin at all with the power of ferrothorn both as a spiker and an all walling behemoth spikes teams became incredibly powerful and metagame defining whether on offense balance stall rain sand or weatherless the only cell that just about never used ferrothorn was sun which was understandable given that grass types they used were their offensive chlorophyll sweepers such as venusaur and saucebuck no matter where ferrothorn wound up it was amazing its passive damage was accentuated more on sand but its fire weakness was significantly diluted on rain to the point where leech seed and leftovers would often out heal the flimsy hidden power fires aimed at it ferrothorn made for incredible defensive combinations with other bulky pokemon the ferrothorn jellicent core otherwise known as ferrocent was an instant classic for the pair's ability to completely devour each other's weaknesses while jellicent provided extra insurance against rapid spin and the two were both excellent against the rain teams that were everywhere ferrothorn and heat ram were similarly excellent and heat ram could get a rock so ferrothorn could focus on spiking and leech seeding everything in sight and those were mainly for sand teams the combination of ferrothorn and rain dish tentacruel under rain gave everyone who faced them a nightmare as they were both unkillable and dished out absurdly suffocating passive damage ferrothorn didn't just make great defensive pairings either its spikes were great at making offensive teammates like latios even more threatening while ferrothorn was the perfect defensive fallback for those offensive pokes to switch to when forced out by a revenge killer sure ferrothorn wasn't immortal it had its weak points that could be exploited mostly being vulnerable to magnezone but there was a reason it was always at the very top of usage stats it didn't matter how predictable ferrothorn was what it brought to the table was so ridiculously good that it was always going to be a consistent performer game in and game out and that was just black and white one too ferrothorn managed to become even better when black and white two arrived sure the addition of keldeo meant ferrothorn wasn't as lights out against rain anymore but it worked the other way too keldeo was also another offensive pokemon who loved ferrothorn's spike support and breaking down several of its checks the main reason ferrothorn got better in black and white 2 though was because it could now legally use all three of stealth rock spikes and leech seed on the same set whereas it had been limited to two of the three in black and white one while sand team still preferred the spikes leech seed protect set this change allowed it to compress an absolute ton of utility into one slot on offensive rain teams which became even more threatening than ever as the metagame continued to develop years after generation 5 was in the past users of rain teams came to a stunning realization leech seed ferrothorn was genuinely impossible to switch into safely for them and KOing it was astonishingly difficult as well many games involved polytoad and tentacruel praying for a burn as they scalded it repeatedly hoping they wouldn't be KO'd by power whip first and no matter the result one player was going to be seriously unhappy the rng didn't go their way the only pokemon that could switch into leech seed that actually fit on these rain teams was either poison heal breloom which was difficult to fit and was often redundant with ferrothorn or well their own ferrothorn which was far far more common what happens in a feral on feral battle maximum hazards are set then they play a game of chicken to see who's going to switch out first neither of them is going to want anything else on their team to switch into leech seed with maximum hazards up but they also don't want to run out of leech seed pp but they also can't spam attacks at each other because of iron barbs so they just spam hazards and try to figure out when to best switch out it's incredibly awkward and this problem was eventually solved by using a move that was previously immensely overlooked knockoff the move was still weak in generation 5 but its usage in generation 6 had caused gen 5 players to reconsider it as they began to see the power of the item removing effect yes folks that is what rain offense became the only way such teams could counter leech seed ferrothorn was by switching to their own ferrothorn and using knockoff they would still get into a max out hazard war and subsequent game of chicken but at least the opposing ferrothorn would be severely hindered for the rest of the game as its survivability was noticeably decreased without leftovers as a result ferrothorn's new standard set on these teams was the same just with knockoff over leech seed knockoff was of course a great move even when the opponent didn't have ferrothorn and as such sand teams with ferrothorn began using the move as well even if their great longevity meant they didn't need to cripple the opposing ferrothorn at all costs it was still valuable for its permanent effect against something like heat ran sand ferrothorn stopped using leech seed too there were just too many games where it didn't do enough instead it started experimenting with worry seed whose effect of changing the opponent's ability to insomnia had several useful applications 
applications. It ruined obnoxious Poison Heal Breloom thinking that it had a free switch in. It was similarly useful for Gliscor and Reuniclus, and it even followed Ferrothorn to escape from Magnazone, allowing it to set up hazards without worrying about being trapped at least once. Ferrothorn could really do whatever it wanted. It could even go offensive. No, not Choice Band. That set was surprisingly adept, but saw little serious tournament use. Though its shockingly powerful Gyro Ball destroyed many unsuspecting resistant targets such as Lucario. Ferrothorn was still a tremendous defensive and support Pokemon, even with no bulk investment beyond maximum HP, and it seemed that everyone dealt with it by burning it. Rain teams did so through Scald, while many Sand teams employed the particularly popular strategy of Will-O-Wisping it with Rotom Wash, allowing Extra Gel to keep hazards off off against Ferrothorn more reliably. Now, Ferrothorn was so good that it usually excelled even when taking burns on a regular basis. However, some players had experimented with pairing Ferrothorn with another grass type, Poison Heal Breloom or Amoongus, designed to absorb burns from water types, significantly increasing Ferrothorn's longevity and reliability. It was a successful strategy on Spike's balance, but not one well suited for more aggressive offensive teams. So on teams such as Rain Offense, Ferrothorn began using an adamant nature with heavy attack investment and equipped itself with a Lumberry. Now it would devour the the burn from Rotom and power whip it into oblivion, while being similarly threatening against Politoed and Tentacruel that dared stay in on it. And a boosted power whip really slammed even bulky Extra Drill. It wasn't going to have perfect longevity if it was burned anyway, so the loss of leftovers wasn't too much of a problem. Since this Ferrothorn was meant for use on highly aggressive teams, and even without leftovers or bulk beyond max HP, it could still easily perform its usual duties of getting hazards, switching into Pokemon like Latios, and of course, knocking off other Ferrothorn. All while counteracting one of the few popular methods that had traditionally been used to deal with it. All in all, Ferrothorn was perhaps the single most significant new Pokemon introduced by Generation 5. Sure, there were plenty of other excellent candidates, several of which were banned to Ubers, but none of them had the nearly endlessly vast utility of Ferrothorn. Even Drizzle Politoed had trouble matching Ferrothorn's sheer level of influence. Sure, it was Rain, but Ferrothorn fit beyond Rain. Ferrothorn defined Generation 5 OU like nothing else, and completely changed the game. Ferrothorn certainly didn't stop at OU though. On day one, it also established itself as one of the best Pokemon in Ubers. With its resist-laden typing, huge bulk, and access to spikes, it was almost as if it had been designed for the tier. It was an incredible answer to none other than Kyogre, and loved partnering with it as well. It could easily come in on Thunders aimed at Ogre to stack spikes or harass the opponent with Leech Seed, and appreciated Ogre's rain reducing its fire weakness. Additionally, Ferrothorn wasn't only a reliable absorber of the metagame, game's many dragon moves. It was one of a mere two Pokemon in the tier to resist both of Zekrom's mighty stabs, and it was far bulkier than Excadrill. Ferrothorn wasn't only good on rain either, sure the Feral Cruel combination wreaked havoc on Ubers as well, but also like an OU, Ferrothorn's incredible utility made it an incredible addition to just about any of the Spikes balance teams that dominated the tier, be they rain, sun, or sand. It was astonishingly, possibly even more consistent than an OU. Would be foils such as Magnezone and Reunicle were non-existent in Ubers, while Latios ran Soul Dew instead of choice items, and thus did not pack Trick. Ferrothorn performed on a game-to-game -game basis with unmatched reliability. In addition to countering monsters such as Kyogre and Zekrom, Ferrothorn even staved off many variants of none other than Arceus, including the Extreme Killer. And that just about says it all, and Ferrothorn could simply do no wrong in Generation 5. Ferrothorn is quite the curious beat in doubles. While its Swiss army arsenal of entry hazards and residual damage make it a formidable singles presence, it's common knowledge that VGC is a faster paced metagame, where Ferrothorn's value as a pivot isn't as necessary. Although VGC squads consist of 6 Pokemon, you still have to consider how the Pokemon will function when it eventually hits the field in a 4 mon formation. And Ferrothorn simply takes up a lot of real estate for a Pokemon whose claim to fame is doing nothing. However, the same restricted team size is what gives Ferrothorn its own niche. With only 4 Pokemon to contend with, Ferrothorn is more likely than usual to serve as a strict roadblock to the opponent's team. In this way, Ferrothorn can paradoxically become even more potent than in singles, as a strict win con achievable through just minor maneuvering. With only 4 Pokemon on the opponent's side, if you knock out the Ferrothorn answers and have got the spike ball in the back, the game is as good as won. It let it leech seed up and win the game. Really, Ferrothorn is basically Shedinja. That's just how polarizing the matchup can be. If you brought this thing against an ill-prepared team, get ready to see them quake in their boots. Ferrothorn itself has 
has had pretty much one set throughout the years, with some notable exceptions we'll get to later. Leech Seed, Protect, Gyro Ball, and Power Whip. In the early days, you mostly saw it with leftovers for additional longevity, and its EVs were spread for maximum survivability. All the better to stall out the game with. Its offensive presence was also not to be scoffed at, although it was of course at its best with Trick Room support from mods such as Cresselia and the like. Because Ferrothorn itself didn't change much, its usage was highly dependent on the metagame surrounding it. As a Pokemon whose number one priority was simply to not be knocked out, Ferrothorn's viability was often inverse to the presence of its only two weaknesses, fighting and fire types. If the opponent was likely to have something that could deal heavy damage to Ferrothorn, putting it on your team was basically committing to very heavy dead weight. So in a fighting heavy metagame like 2011, Ferrothorn was an awful choice. While in 2012, it was slightly more prevalent. In general, there are a few common meta trends that define Ferrothorn throughout its entire lifespan. As in singles, it functions very well in rain and sand for obvious reasons, but it's also one of the best rain counters out there due to its natural resistances and ability to obliterate water types even with minimal investment. Let's not forget that it's got a surprisingly high attack stat to back up those power whips. In a similar vein, Ferrothorn is arguably the best Rotom Wash counter in existence and has been since it first emerged. A great title to have since Rotom Wash itself is often ubiquitous. Finally, Ferrothorn is a good tank against dragon moves, though it had to be wary of stray fire blasts from the likes of High Dragon. All of this combined made 2012 a more hospitable environment, although Ferrothorn certainly still wasn't taking the world by storm. It was a mon you absolutely had to be prepared for, but the general sentiment was that Ferrothorn was something of a gatekeeper for noobs. If you had it marked off quote-unquote Ferrothorn counter on your team building checklist, you simply hadn't put in the work, considering how easy it was to slap a hidden power fire or some other coverage on any given Pokemon. That said, one trainer gave Ferrothorn results to be proud of, Luke Swenson, who did well with Ferrothorn at Fall Regionals and eventually took it all the way to top 8 of the US National. Luke's Ferrothorn was bog standard, but he built his regionals team purely around eliminating Ferrothorn threats, trademarked that one, and saw good results. However, it was by actually reducing Ferrothorn to a more role player that Luke found his national success, acknowledging that Ferrothorn's mere presence on a team sheet was enough to give the opponent second thoughts. That said, we should still acknowledge some of his Ferrotech. Again, let's copyright that. Namely, a Sableye with Prankster Burn and Trick Lagging Tail to let Ferrothorn move first, as well as intimidate support from Gyarados. However, Ben was really the only player to make Ferrothorn work in 2012, and while it wasn't an uncommon sight to see pop up, the rest were often co-signed to a Tulsi exit as soon as they appeared. 2013 made way for a select few more Ferrothorn players. Miguel Marti de la Torre gave it an 8th place finish at the Milan Nationals, and two Ferrothorns popped up in top 16 of Australian Nationals courtesy of Marcus Raj and the eventual champion Ben Kilby. Ben's rain-based Ferrothorn team may have taken home the Australian top honors, but the same squad finished just 44th at Worlds stymied by a spread of heat rans and Volcaronas that made Ferrothorn's life very, very hard. At this point, we should also mention that Ferrothorn faced stiff competition from Amoongus as a fellow grass type. Ferrothorn finished Gen 5 mostly a doubles afterthought, something to keep your eye out for, but nowhere near the universal usage it saw in singles. Ferrothorn wasn't too popular in the early stages of XYOU. Many players viewed it as not much more than a Spikes machine, and with Generation 6's Defog buff, Spikes as a whole just about disappeared from the metagame, and as such, so did Ferrothorn. However, it didn't take too long before players remembered that Ferrothorn had one of the most astonishing defensive profiles in the game, and quickly put it to use. At first, it didn't even bother using hazards. It simply used Leech Seed, Protect, and its stab moves, and was incredibly effective at walling enormous portions of the metagame. Even countering most variants of the terrifying future ubers Aegislash and Greninja. Greninja didn't start running Hidden Power Fire until Ferrothorn came around, and even then, not all variants did. Plus, those that did run Hidden Power Fire would have their overall coverage severely limited, given how specific the move was. Thus, even when Ferrothorn itself couldn't answer Greninja, it still managed to make Greninja worse. Additionally, Ferrothorn was generally far less threatened by Hidden Power Fire from other Pokemon like Latios and Magnezone, thanks to the move's base power nerf. Sure, Ferrothorn didn't love that its steel typing no longer resisted Dark and Ghost, but it also gained an immensely useful resist to the new fairy type, allowing Ferrothorn to switch in against the many moon blasts and play roughs flying around. It could also switch in with ease against the increasingly popular poison and steel moves aimed at these same fairy types. Then Oraz came around and the player base realized that spikes were so excellent by virtue of Ferrothorn having approximately a million opportunities to switch in per game, and the fact that the defoggers really weren't that reliable. Put simply, if one 
relied on the fog to deal with spikes, Ferrothorn would ruin them, sticking around forever with Leech Seed and removing leftovers with knockoff. Spike stacking teams came to dominate the metagame, and Ferrothorn usage exploded. Now, it wasn't always the Spiker since Skarmory was also great, but Ferrothorn was definitely the easier Pokemon to slot on a team thanks to its amazing defensive profile, which forcibly shaped the metagame. It forced Mega Metagross to run Hammer Arm or pair with Magnezone if it didn't want to be hopelessly walled, while famed Balance Breaker Tail Glow Manaphy was forced to compromise its coverage with Hidden Power Fire if it wanted to actually break the balance teams Ferrothorn anchored so reliably. Ferrothorn wasn't only an amazing defensive Pokemon, it also paired well with other amazing defensive Pokemon, such as Clefable, Gliscor, and Mega Latias, forming excellent bulky cores that covered each other's weaknesses with a plum, while wearing the opposition down through residual damage, which of course included Ferrothorn's spikes and leech seeds, accentuated further by its knockoffs. Ferrothorn was a beacon of flexibility, consistency, and reliability. Plus, for all its defensive prowess, it fit on offensive teams beautifully as well. After all, the tools it provided were highly aggressive ones that fast-paced threats loved being paired with, and to provide such tools while having such a valuable defensive profile was just wonderful. Rocks and spikes, knockoff, leech seed, thunder wave, actually hard-hitting stabs that threatened heavy damage, even KOs against common offensive Pokemon, even those with solid natural bulk to them like Keldeo, to play defense against some of the scariest Pokemon around without being passive, and to aggressively support without losing defensive value, Ferrothorn could really do it all. Even its weaknesses could be taken advantage of. Using Magnezone to remove Ferrothorn? Oops, Mega Alakazam just traced Magnapole and set up six Calm Minds. Alternatively, Ferrothorn would knock off Magnezone's Scarf, and then a teammate like Mega Metagross would go berserk. Seeing as how many teams relied on Magnezone to remove Ferrothorn since Ferrothorn effortlessly walled so much, this was potentially game-breaking. And it's just one anti-Ferrothorn poke that Ferrothorn could easily take its advantage. This was the mark of a truly elite Pokemon. It was almost without drawback, as long as it was used conscientiously. Ferrothorn's range was nearly limitless. It just depended on what its team and its user wanted it to do. Remove the abilities Gliscor, Clefable, and even Magnezone relied on? Worry Seed had that covered. Needing to actually hit Clefable without the easily stalled Gyro Ball? Sure, just tack on Iron Head instead. Some players really got extreme with their experimentation. Even the likes of Explosion, Toxic, and Rest saw the briefest of uses. The best part was, no matter how wacky you got, Ferrothorn was still going to perform in pretty much every game. It was gonna get hazards, and it was gonna shrug off Draco Meteor, and it was gonna be annoying in about six other ways too. As such, Ferrothorn was one of the most defining, superb Pokemon in Generation 6 OU. It could and did do it all, and it did it over and over and over again, even when you knew it was coming. In fact, it sometimes counted on you knowing it was coming, and that was something it could count on pretty much every time. Ferrothorn wasn't as outright dominant in Gen 6 Ubers. It had direct competition as a defensive spiking steel type with Klefki, who had the invaluable trait of being the best check to the most monstrous Pokemon in the game, Xerneas. However, Ferrothorn was still thoroughly excellent, as it could do one crucial thing Klefki couldn't dream of, answer Kyogre. This was key in early XY, when Specs Kyogre was everywhere, and became even more key in Oraz when Primal Kyogre joined the fray. Additionally, the Lighty Twins regained the soul dude they'd been missing in XY, and became both top defoggers and offensive threats. Ferrothorn, of course, ruined them on both fronts. What else did Ferrothorn take on? Oh, just Arceus, no big deal. Not only was it solid at managing the E-Killer and Combine variants, Ferrothorn also took advantage of the weak, passive defog Arceus forms like nothing else. If you were relying on defog Arceus to keep your side of the field free from spikes, Ferrothorn was gonna make you pay for it. As if all that wasn't enough, Ferrothorn also stifled several other threats such as Mega Kangaskhan, helped pivot around monstrously powerful moves like Deoxys Attack Psycho boost, and Mega Mewtwo wise Psy Strike, and was annoying to pretty much everything just by spamming Leech Seed, given the tier's lack of immunities, and could act as an excellent lure to threats like Ho-Oh and Primal Groudon with Toxic. So at the end of the day, yes, Ferrothorn wasn't as outright dominant as it had been in Generation 5 Ubers, but it was still absolutely elite. Imagine that, being this good in Ubers of all tiers was actually a step down for Ferrothorn. What a monster. Generation 6 brought with it a major realignment of power, first to fairy types, and secondly to the newly amped Mega Evolution. As luck would have it, both were just the thing Ferrothorn needed to find a place in the VGC metagame. Its proficiency at checking fairies should be self-evident, but its place in the Mega meta may take a bit more explanation. Throughout 2014, there were three Mega Pokemon that absolutely dominated the game, Kangaskhan, Mawile, and Charizard Y. In that order, Ferrothorn coincidentally has a matchup spread against those Megas that follows exactly that that order. Incredible against Kangaskhan, okay against Mawile, and a total liability against Zard. Ferrothorn greatly appreciated the physical
physical heavy metagame, which gave it a chance to get involved past being a late game win con in the back. Mega Kangaskhan had to think twice about attacking into a potential Ferrothorn slot, which, when considering a Rocky Helmet and Iron Barbs combo, was likely to tear up Kang's mitts just from the recoil damage. Mawile similarly didn't appreciate Ferrothorn's physical prowess. However, Mawile posed other problems for Ferrothorn as a potential competitor for a Steel type slot on the team. And with Charizard Y and Talonflame running around, there were certainly plenty of fiery threats to Ferrothorn's continued presence on the field. Fairy types decreased fighting types usage and increased fire type presence. Fire had a good matchup against fairies and against the steel types that beat them such as Mawile, Aegislash, and of course Ferrothorn. While Ferrothorn loved to see a Rotom wash, the same couldn't be said for Rotom Heat, who was its worst nightmare in team preview, other than Charizard and Heat Ran, of course. However, its sheer usefulness against 2014's top dog made Ferrothorn a very useful Pokemon to have on a team. If other parts of your team can handle Charizard or Manetric or whatever other mega Pokemon there might be, Ferrothorn was a potentially indispensable aid for Kangaskhan, and still quite capable of being a win con on its own. The first player to show Ferrothorn's potential was none other than three-time champ Ray Rizzo, who piloted his Ferrothorn to a win at the very first regionals of the format in Virginia. In typical Ray fashion, he innovated an EV spread that would shake up the metagame for months to come. Although in this case, it wasn't putting defensive EVs on an offensive Pokemon, it was putting offensive EVs on a defensive Pokemon. Ray's significant attack investment and Lumberry alongside Ferrothorn's brave nature made it an even more incredible Rotom Wash counter, as it could now tank a will o -Wisp and pick up a one-hit KO in return. This was important as Rotom Wash was even more prevalent because, well, because it was pretty good at what Ferrothorn did too, namely checking physical attackers. That's why Ray had one on his team after all. Rotom and Pharaoh had excellent synergy typing-wise and in their ability to totally stall while opposing physical threats, and it was rare to see Ferrothorn without one. Ray's EV spread and Lumberry were quick to catch on, although you'd still see Rocky Helmet or a defensive build sometimes as well. Ray's victory in Virginia portended quite a few significant Ferrothorn placements down the road. Winter Regional saw a collective five Ferrothorns among the top eight of four different tournaments. Credit to Scott Glaza, Casey Trevor, and Paul Hornack in Missouri, Salem, and Long Beach respectively, and to Ray and Steven Scruggs in Orlando, where Ray took fifth and Steven notched a silver medal finish. Ferrothorn hovered at about a 10% usage from most of the season, and while it wasn't meta-defining, it was certainly a frequent sight in top eights, even in other regions. Another five Ferrothorn players made top eight at the Battle Road Gloria qualifiers in Japan across three tournaments. Spring Regionals showcased more of the same, with another five Pharaohs in top eight. Jason Artie Winja took seventh in Seattle, while Trista Ryuzaki Medin finished eighth in Madison. And special notice has to be paid to Athens, Georgia, where Ed Glover, Daniel Bird, and Andre Alta were able to come together to give Ferrothorn three placements in one top eight. So certainly an improvement from about three top eights in total the year prior. As Worlds approached, Ferrothorn uses slightly dropped, but it was still putting up some good results. Ben Kiriko placed 8th at the Italy Nationals using a Ferrothorn heavily inspired by Ray's. Ferrothorn also saw significant play in the Oceanic region, although by this point you should know that we don't have full names for results for some results in this region. Nevertheless, you can see from the results that Ferrothorn was quite prevalent down under, including at Australian Nationals, where you can tell that Ash Bakar gave it 5th place and Michael Warzicki took home a silver medal. However, there wasn't a single Ferrothorn to be seen at the US Nationals Top 8, a sign of things to come at Worlds. You see, by Worlds, players had caught on to the fact that Kangaskhan was dominating the meta, and everyone and their mother came prepared with its counters. Mawile, Aegislash, and yeah, Ferrothorn. So what we actually saw was a decent amount of Ferrothorn play, but with not incredible results. Because with fewer Kangaskhans, Ferrothorn did worse, and the truly perceptive players were already one step of the adaptation, bringing excessive coverage for the Mawiles they knew would be coming, which happened to also handle Ferrothorn pretty well. The highest placing Ferrothorn player at Worlds was Ben Kiriko, who had shifted his Ferrothorn to be, in his words, quote, less of an offensive Pokemon necessarily, and more of a win condition that attacks things, end quote. Ben placed 15th, and while five other players brought Ferrothorn, they all placed outside of the top 16. However, Ferrothorn's less than stellar performance at Worlds didn't prevent players from bringing it to the last events of the format, and because 2014 took so long to end, players got to try on one more set of fall regionals with the same metagame, where, true to form, Ferrothorn found itself as a minor member of multiple top 8s, credit to Enosha Carr's 3rd place in Philadelphia, Javier Madrid's 4th in Phoenix, and Colton Leibert's 7th in San Jose. Finally, Guan Yang Zi, also known as Level 51, gave Ferrothorn a nice send-off to 2014 by winning the Singapore Asia Cup qualifier with the same Ferrothorn spread Ben Kiriko had brought to World, albeit with leftovers instead of Rocky Helmet. Unfortunately for Ferrothorn, 2015 turned up the heat, reintroducing Heatran, Volcarona, Chandelure, and Entei, as well as 
establishing new threats such as Mega Camera. Nevertheless, some players continued to use Ferrothorn, and it remained the somewhat common sight in regional top 8, sporting exactly the same set as before. Take a look at Winter Regionals and you'll see the same patterns as previously. About one Ferrothorn in each top 8, whether it was Amar Big's Mega Camera Up team or Russian Sakar's Mega Kangaskhan. Special mention, however, to Alberto Lara, who showed that Ferrothorn could function in unexpected conditions by winning California Regionals with a hyper offensive team that made use of Mega Salamence and Sylveon's dual spread moves to clear a path for Ferrothorn. Ferrothorn continued to pop up in other regional top 8s as well. Whether it was Eden Bachelor in the UK, Gabriel Voon and Joshua Pethic in Perth, or Joaquin Page in Mexico City. However, it was clear that it wasn't as premier a threat it had been the year prior. Don't tell that to Alberto though. He continued to show how potent Ferrothorn could be with an offensive lineup, as he was able to win his second regional of the format in Utah with a similar hyper offensive build to his California team. Alberto wasn't the only player to give Ferrothorn a first place finish. Joaquin Capuzano also managed to put together a gold medal run at Mexico City's second regionals after he had used the same team to play second in a few months prior. Ferrothorn also made a couple of national appearances. Brendan Webb gave it a sixth place finish in Australia, and Jamie Miller took seventh in the UK. But more telling was the amount of Ferrothorns that placed outside of top eight. People were still occasionally using it, but struggled to find the same success they had. That trend held true going into Worlds, where despite four finishes in the top 32, there wasn't a single Ferrothorn in the top 16, cementing 2015 as one of Ferrothorn's more fallow years results-wise. The weather wars that dominated 2016 made for quite a polarizing environment for Ferrothorn. On the one hand, you had Kyogre, the greatest partner that Ferrothorn could ever hope for, a bulwark against potential fire types, and a terrifying Mon in its own right. And then of course, there was Groudon. While Groudon was a big threat to Ferrothorn, the sun honestly wasn't as bad as you might think. Chances are, if Ferrothorn was getting hit by a fire move, it was already dead to rights anyways. That said, Ferrothorn still did not appreciate staring down a Groudon. It also has to be said that Ferrothorn was an excellent answer to Xerneas, who was of course one of the most dominant Pokemon of the format, and it didn't do too shabby against Rayquaza either, making it a powerful answer to Ray Ogre teams in its own right, as well as a powerful asset to them. As you might expect, most Ferrothorn teams were deployed on Kyogre teams, and it was able to put up a good scattering of results across all regions, with the two highest placings being Joshua Kalisher's second place at Adelaide Regionals and Yure Nunes' second in Italian Nationals, but still no gold medal to call its own. Shoutouts to the Iconoclasts who were actually able to make Ferrothorn without Kyogre, including Brandon Miller's 7th place at Adelaide Regionals, Joseph Doe's 4th in Sydney, Daniel Bagulay's 3rd in Perth, and Stefan Smygok's 8th place at US Nationals. At Worlds, Ferrothorn's only recorded finish was Matthias Sutrodolski's 16th place, but it found a nice epilogue to its Gen 6 performance after Worlds, when Matthias was able to give the same team a first place finish at the Dortmund Regional, meaning Ferrothorn at least got to take one gold medal home in every year of Generation 6. So not bad for a mod that used to be known as a noob buster. Ferrothorn more or less reprised its Gen 6 role in Gen 7. It went through some major changes, but the overall role wound up essentially the same. First, the negative changes. Ferrothorn was now threatened as a defensive Pokemon than it ever had been before by the addition of Z-moves, whose Z-crystals also allowed their holders immunity to Ferrothorn's knockoff. Its Thunder Wave was less threatening as well, with the nerf to the speed drop and accuracy. However annoying though these nerfs were, they were almost unnoticeable in comparison to those changes that allowed Ferrothorn to absolutely thrive an OU once again. Right off the bat, several new additions, which were instantly among the most popular Pokemon in OU, were dealt with in some capacity by Ferrothorn. It loved the infestation of five new fairy types in Magirna and the four Tapus. Not only did it resist their fairy stab, it resisted their secondary stabs too, and it hit all of them back hard, with the exception of Magirna, who still didn't take kindly to Leech Seed. Sure, Ferrothorn had to contend with the occasional fighting type coverage, but simply being able to fend off the stabs was already huge in helping its team deal with these Pokemon. And of course, if there was ever a Pokemon that could take a stray super effective hit, even one from such powerful threats, it was Ferrothorn. Ferrothorn also helped deal with the immensely frightening Battle Bond Greninja, resisting Hydro Pumps and fending off even neutral Dark Pulses with ease, sticking around all game, standing as an immovable wall in the face of its attempt to evolve into Ash Greninja. Speaking of sticking around all game, Ferrothorn was a big fan of the Tapu's existence for another reason. It was a major beneficiary of both Grassy and 
misty terrain. The former gave it even more passive damage, which was amazing in and of itself, and strengthened Ferrothorn's power rip, while the latter meant Ferrothorn didn't have to fear Scald Burns. That brings us to another excellent boon Gen 7 gave Ferrothorn, the Burn nerf. Now Burn only dealt 6.25% as opposed to its previous 12.5%, meaning that it wouldn't even outdamage leftovers. It was effectively Sandstorm. This meant that Ferrothorn no longer had to fear being put on a timer if it switched into Toxapex and ate a Burn. It would truck on almost completely unperturbed. Speaking of Toxapex, the Ferropex combination quickly became the stuff of nightmares, as the two paired for an absolutely nightmarish mishmash of defensive walling, hazard spam, passive damage, and self-healing. Speaking of Leech Seed, there was yet another amazing new Pokemon Ferrothorn paired up with beautifully, Celesteela. Together, the two spammed Leech Seed to high heaven all over entire opposing teams. Of course, as always though, Ferrothorn was primarily thought of as a defensive Pokemon, and did fit perfectly on defensive spike stacking teams alongside Clefable and Gliscor and Mega Latias, as it always did. It also fit beautifully on offense teams as well. It had all sorts of applications, from its great useful traits of hazard pressure and defensive utility, to more specific scenarios like knocking off Scarf Magnezone to let fast superpower Mega Scizor go berserk, but nowhere was this more apparent than on Rain teams, which experienced a resurgence in Gen 7 thanks to Pelipper gaining Drizzle. The change in Mega Mechanics allowing Mega Swamper to instantly gain Swift Swim as soon as it Mega Evolved, and the addition of Ash Greninja, which was truly monstrous under Rain. In fact, Ferrothorn was immensely useful in keeping Rain teams in check. However, it was also an indispensable part of their composition. They perfectly exemplified what Ferrothorn brought to offense. The easy hazards, the necessary backbone against threats like Choice Scarf Tapu Lele, packing hazards not only did the usual job of making Ferrothorn's teammates, like the ever U-turning and vault switching Tapu Koko, more threatening in battle, but it also did so by letting them run more threatening sets. Ferrothorn taking on hazard duty meant Mega Swampert didn't need to run Stealth Rock, and more commonly and importantly, it meant Ash Greninja didn't need to run Spikes, allowing it to fit Ice Beam into its moveset and making it even more terrifying when it could no longer be checked by the likes of Tangrowth and Tapu Bulu. Once again, Ferrothorn could and did do it all. This extended to luring its answers too. This was most commonly seen on rain teams, where it sometimes slotted in Thunder Wave to ruin Tornado Styrian switch-ins, but the most outrageous example came in how Ferrothorn dealt with Kartana. Kartana was well regarded precisely for how well its Z-Crystal and Choice Band sets switched into Ferrothorn. It walled most Ferrothorn variants, threatened Ferrothorn with damage, and could defog away Ferrothorn's hazard. Sure, Ferrothorn could run Thunder Wave, which also hit Tornado Styrian and Fire types and so on, but sometimes this wouldn't work against Kartana, such as under Misty Terrain or if Ferrothorn had been taunted. Plus, Thunder Wave didn't change the fact that Kartana would be in and be immensely threatening against Ferrothorn. Sometimes a more direct approach was necessary. As such, on quite a few occasions, Ferrothorn did in fact run Hidden Power Fire, and it worked. If there was a Kartana on the opposing team, it was probably coming in on Ferrothorn, and if and when it did, it was going to get rocked. So all in all, chalk up the third incredibly successful OU generation for Ferrothorn. Here was a Pokemon who simply could not fail, even when running a 60 base power special attack off of one of the weakest special attack stats in the game. Generation 7 also saw Ferrothorn achieve immense success in Ubers once again. Its resist, bulk, and move pool were perfectly suited for the tier. It started off strong in Sun and Moon, and it was great in both offensive and defensive matchups alike. In the former, it would save off Primal Kyogre, Newcomer Lunala, and more, while in the latter, it would endlessly harass slow, bulky teams. Then Ultra Sun and Moon came along, bringing many monstrous new threats. More Shadow, Naga Nadel, and Necrozma Dustmane, which could also become Ultra Necrozma, which is and remains utterly insane. So yeah, here you're facing Metagross, but it also might secretly be and turn into Salamence. Perhaps Game Freak's most lunatic decision to date. Anyway, these changes were brutal. So brutal, in fact, that they knocked the Deoxys forms out of viability. Deoxys, whose attack form was one of the most dangerous Uber Pokemon since its inception in Generation 3, and whose speed form had completely shaped the tier since it gained Stealth Rock in Generation 4. So if Deoxys could no longer hack it, did this mean Ferrothorn was toast too? Nope. Here lies the secret of Ferrothorn. No matter how absurdly, brutally overpowered a new Pokemon is, Ferrothorn almost always keeps it in check. It's not as flashy as a Pokemon that outspeeds and one-hit KOs everything, but it is a lot more reliable. Those resists with that bulk prove themselves as more durable than any glass cannon. So sure, there were these new threats, but what Pokemon could withstand the utterly obscene Swords Dance Dustmane and Ultra Necrozma? Ferrothorn, of course. It wasn't a hard counter by any means, but to simply be able to take hits and respond was invaluable in a metagame as hostile and unforgiving as Ubers. This was on top of all of its other duties, by the way, which also included answering the monstrously dangerous, immensely popular Arceus Ground. Ferrothorn was, once again, utterly killer in Generation 7 Ubers.
years. And yes, it was its weakest generation in the tier yet, and it still had an incredibly important place in it, holding it together against some of the most vicious Pokemon in the entire game. Who else but Ferrothorn? Ferrothorn wasn't available for VGC 2017, but it made a return in 2018 to cast fear into the hearts of anyone not prepared with a fire move. Unfortunately for Ferrothorn, that wasn't a lot of players, thanks to the return of the usual Thorn in its side, Charizard Y, Heatran, Volcarota, and Rotom Heat. Luckily for Ferrothorn, it had an expanded list of good matchups, namely the Tapus. More fairy means more Pharaoh. Thorn, that is. As always, the game plan with Ferrothorn was mostly to eliminate its threats and then turn it into a win condition. It was just a matter of figuring out whether that win condition was worth the team slot. 2018 also marked the advent of Choice Ban Ferrothorn, a sneaky set that could annihilate unsuspecting opponents with its surprisingly high power. This set replaced Protect with Knock Off and typically chose Bulldoze or Iron Head as their last move, though it was mostly filler. Ferrothorn made its presence known in special events, with top 8 placements thanks to Matias Caricio, Federico Enquiso, and Juan Pablo Nar. Its first real test came at the Sydney Internationals, which was a good barometer for Ferrothorn's overall viability. A pair of 15th and 25th place finishes showed that people were still considering Ferrothorn as a win con defensive pivot and check terrain, but it certainly wasn't a preeminent threat. Nevertheless, it continued to show up in top eights around. Kudos to Diego Paredes, Diego Ortiz, and Estefan Valdo Benito in Latin America, while Eric Rios and Stefan Somo took top eight at the Malmo Regionals, and Jurari Wat Theta City took a top eight placement on his own in Costa Mesa. The middle of the season introduced one of Ferrothorn's greatest nemeses, Incineroar. Well, more accurately, Intimidate Incineroar. Incineroar had been around for a while, but as you might know by now, Intimidate catapulted Incineroar to the top of usage, and just its increased presence was bad news for Ferrothorn. It wasn't the worst of the fire-type matchups, as with Iron Barbs and Flare Blitz recoil, Incineroar was signing away a good chunk of its HP bar to take out Ferrothorn, but it still wasn't a kind sight for Ferrothorn. Nevertheless, Ferrothorn still managed to keep a grip on some form of relevancy, putting up top 8 finishes in Uruguay, Hong Kong, and the Korean Spring League. Special mention has to go to the Taiwan special event, where Wu Chen, Lin Jie Ru, Lu Jian Ting, and Tong Che took 4 of the top 8 spots, with the exact same team. This group of players paired Ferrothorn with Mega Aerodactyl and Landers Thurian, great partners to remove any pesky fire types. Wu Chen and Lu Jing Ting actually went on to take this team to regionals, where Chen took 3rd in Taiwan, and Lu Jian Ting placed 4th in Hong Kong. Rounding out the list of regional placers were Miguel Marta de la Torre, Ivan Inostroza, and Eric Reels, who took home first place at the extremely stacked Dreamhack Valencia. However, Ferrothorn didn't make a single appearance at Worlds, where the prevalence of Incineroar and Charizard simply made picking it an inadvisable decision to say the least. It at least got a consolation prize via a familiar face though, Ben Kiriko, who actually took second at the Nashville Open. The gigantic tournament held concurrently with Worlds for everyone who didn't make the top cut, meaning it was still one of the most stacked tournaments of the year, and to make things better, Ben did it with Banded Ferrothorn, opting for Seed Bomb as his last move for extra reliability. If you remember Ferrothorn in the 2016 meta, chances are you've got a pretty good idea of how things played out in 2019. Ferrothorn like Kyogre, Ferrothorn no like Groudon, Ferrothorn good against Xerneas and Rayquaza. As always, Ferrothorn often found its way onto Kyogre teams, starting with Andrew Burley's second place in Philadelphia. From there, the trend only continued with Melvin Kez's first place at the Katong special event, as well as Maritan Teo and Brian Sol's top 8 placements in Malaysia. However, this go-round, Ferrothorn was actually to put together some international results, at least in the Sun series, when Xerneas was even more prominent. Melvin Kedd took his Ferrothorn to a 7th place finish at the Sao Paulo Regionals with a Zern Don team, closely followed by Kyle Romanini's Kyogre Veltal Peric. Alejandro Jimenez used his own Zern Don team to get Ferrothorn a 5th place finish at the Anaheim Regionals. Melbourne Internationals and the Switch to Moon series saw a temporary dip in Ferrothorn placements, but it kept on trucking along after that with good placements, such as Fezix Okan's 8th and Can, and even won a few regionals courtesy of Megan Rattle and Alexander Williams. In Berlin, Kibo Nishimura gave Ferrothorn another top 8 international appearance with his unusual Assault Vest set, which used an attacking spread of Power Whip, Gyro Ball, Knock Off, and Bulldoze. Other successful Ferrothorn users are pictured here. As you can see, it continued to thrive alongside Kyogre, notching up a slew of top 8 placements around the world. However, its absence from the top 16 of Columbus Internationals portended a dearth at Worlds, where the lone Ferrothorn placement came at a mediocre 59th place. Although 
and a repeat of the year prior, it took second place at the open tournament happening after Worlds, courtesy of Adrian Hurley. A few players continued to use Ferrothorn throughout the tail end of the season, giving a very similar arc to years past, a sometimes good Pokemon who could rack up impressive placements, but never successful at the biggest events of the year. And here's a brief digestion on why that may be. As we've mentioned, Ferrothorn really works best as sort of a quote-unquote checkmate button to your opponent. At a Pokemon tournament, one win in Swiss can be massive, meaning Ferrothorn's ability to get even a couple wins can make it worth bringing. However, the more players at a tournament, the more wins you need, and the more players likely to make Ferrothorn dead weight. In short, against a larger field, the wins Ferrothorn can pull become less impactful and are less likely to happen. It's just math. Oh no, the player base cried. Generation 8's edition of Heavy Duty Boots will make entry hazards obsolete. Ferrothorn laughed and used Knockoff. A knockoff which, by the way, no longer had immunities, seeing as Mega Stones and Z Crystals had also been yeeted out of the metagame. And so had Hidden Power for that matter. No longer could Pokemon slap on Hidden Power Fire in pathetic attempts to not be permanently ruined by Pharaoh. The mighty Pharaoh Pex walling combination was back and more obnoxious than ever. That said, the presence of Boots did slow Pharaoh down, as it could no no longer exert such immense pressure over entire teams whenever it got a free turn. However, not every Pokemon ran boots, and many of those that did, namely the incredibly popular Mandibuzz, were Ferrothorn bait. If a team over relied on using Mandibuzz or Corviknight to clear hazards, Ferrothorn could and did punish them severely. It also preyed on the prominence of the Vault Switch blocking Groudon types Hippowdon, Rhyperior, and Seismatos. Speaking of Seisma, Ferrothorn was similar to it in that it was one of the few Pokemon that could at all withstand the mighty Dracovicious Fish's Rens. For this reason, Reason, it ran a physically defensive spread, which also let it take on the popular extra drill much more effectively as well. Investing in defense had another boon too. Ferrothorn had received the amazing body press and could now use its huge defense stat as an offensive weapon in what was perhaps the most perfect encapsulation of the Ferrothorn ethos since Iron Barb's effect had first been discovered. Then the Isle of Armor came around and the newly introduced Yoshifu came to utterly dominate the tier. It was nearly impossible to switch into and its absolutely absurd ability Unseen Fist meant Ferrothorn couldn't even use Protect to scout the Choice Bander's intention. The dominance of Yoshifu as well as the utterly ridiculous Libero Cinderace meant Ferrothorn wasn't going to be walling the entire metagame anytime soon. That said, Ferrothorn remained a valuable Pokemon. Its role in the Hazard game remained key, as did its ability to help pivot around other immensely dangerous threats like Zeraora, Spex, Magirna, and Kyurem. In fact, Ferrothorn was a great Yoshifu partner. It could easily punish the Mandibuzz that tried to absorb Wicked Blow. With the eventual bands of Cinderace and Magirna, Ferrothorn's position in the metagame was straightened. And then came the Crown Tundra, bringing with it a ton of familiar faces, such as Heatran, Lander Asterion, Zapdos, the Tapus, and more. Melmetal, Magirna, and Cinderace were unbanned, Feromosa was released into OU, and a monstrous new threat in Spectrier was introduced. All this in addition to the carnage that Yoshifu was unleashing and continued to unleash. So how did Ferrothorn perform in the midst of all this chaos? Well, you should know the answer to that by now. It didn't miss a beat. It was an outstanding answer to Coco and Feeny. It was a great check to many variants of Melmetal, Magirna, and even Spectrier. Eventually, all of Yoshifu, Spectrier, Magirna, and Cinderace were banned, and Ferrothorn's walling and support potential just kept going up and up. It loved the prevalence of the standard, specially defensive Defog Lander Asterion, once again taking advantage of a common hazard remover to litter the field with hazards. With physical defense investment it already used to handle the likes of Melmetal and Lander's T, Ferrothorn also answered plenty of other rising threats, most notably the metagame defining Weavile, as well as many setup variants of Garchomp and Dragonite, usually in conjunction with a partner Lando T of its own. It was still a naturally effective check to special attackers like the Tapus too. Eventually, Kyurem was banned, and that made Ferrothorn even better. It continues to reign in Gen 8 OU to this day, fitting on all sorts of teams and performing as consistently as ever. It particularly enjoys using Rocky Helmet as a peerless punisher of Weavile's triple axel. So once again, Ferrothorn has been an OU super Superstar. For the first time, Ferrothorn's foray into Ubers fell a bit flat. Its typing was no longer as ideally suited to the tier. Given Dexet's removal of Pokemon like Kyogre that it had previously been tasked with handling, and Sword and Shield's addition of several new Ubers, it didn't take too kindly at all. To say nothing of Heavy Duty Boots neutralizing much of the pressure it had so effortlessly exerted prior. Ferrothorn wasn't going to be doing anything against Zacian Crowned, Zamazenta Crowned, Eternatus, Galarian, Darmanitan, plus Gothitelle was around to trap it without 
about the fear of the now removed pursuit, and even Pokemon Ferrothorn checked on paper like Gyarados were capable of overwhelming it through Dynamax. Ferrothorn wasn't bad, as it could handle the excellent Rotom Wash nicely, and it was decent against Rain, but its niche was more specific than ever, especially with the eventual release of other Steel types, who were more valuable for their ability to actually check Zacian Crown, especially Necrozma Duskmane. Another factor that seriously hurt Ferrothorn was the increased prominence of Sun Teams filled with Fire types, whether it was Choice Specs Solar Power Charizard, who had the option to Gigantamax, or the fearsome Quiverdance Volcarona, and its capacity to be one of the tier's most fearsome Dynamaxers. Ferrothorn wasn't finding a ton of walling opportunities. Even the Sunsetter Torkoal was difficult for it to deal with, as it could rapid spin away Ferrothorn's spikes. Ferrothorn wasn't a good defensive Dynamaxer either. Choices like Quagsire were preferred for such a role, as its moves could change the weather and thus better slow down the opposition. As such, though Ferrothorn still remained a niche, it was a rare sight in serious play, and it only got worse when the Isle of Armor came around, as Sun Teams now packed another top threat it couldn't wall, in the monstrously dangerous Venusaur. Plus, hyper offense teams, rife with brutal Dynamaxers, became popular as well, and Ferrothorn couldn't handle them either. It just didn't have the same general reach as other popular walls, mainly Toxapex and Corviknight. They could actually help keep Zacian Crown in check to an extent, whereas Ferrothorn just got destroyed. Furthermore, Pex and Corviknight were much more useful against the Rain, Sun, and Sand teams that dominated the tier. Toxapex was useful for stifling Rain and Sun and could haze obnoxious Dynamax boosters, making it good against Hyper Offense as well, while Corviknight had the excellent trait of reliably taking on Sand teams, namely the incredibly dangerous Dynamax Excadrill. Then the Crown Tundra came around and finally, Ferrothorn returned to its elite uber status. The change wasn't instant, but some semblance of it was immediately noticeable. Though Zacian Crown continued to rampage through the tier, and using Ferrothorn as a grass type over one of the few semi-answers Tangrowth could prove to be challenging in that regard, it also came with the immense benefits of handling the monstrously dangerous Kyogre, Necrozma Dustmane, and Zekrom, the latter of which had become one of the most dangerous threats around with Dragon Dance. Then both Zacian Crown and Zacian were banned from Ubers, and Ferrothorn exploded in both popularity and viability. It rose through the ranks and became considered the best non-Uber Pokemon in the metagame. It came in completely free against the popular support Dustmane set of Iron Head, Thunder Wave, Stealth Rock, and either Morning Sun or Moonlight, allowing it to span obscenely annoying moves like Spikes and Leech Seed to its heart's content. They were easy to use because they were effective against pretty much everything. Ferrothorn similarly abused the popular defensive Xerneas sets. Ferrothorn primarily used an Iron Defense Body Press set to become completely unbreakable on the physical side, letting it sit on the tier's many physical boosters, and potentially even posing a threat to sweep in return. Alternatively, it could run Curse and Knock Off, which was slightly less reliable defensively, but only slightly, and came with the massive benefit of letting Ferrothorn use Knock Off, which it was incredibly effective at doing, removing Ho-Oh's heavy duty boots or ridding the likes of Groudon and Zygarde Complete of their leftovers was absolutely amazing. Plus, Knock Off let Ferrothorn hit the brutally dangerous Calyrex Shadow. Ferrothorn could also go specially defensive, using Bullet Seed and Knock Off to reliably deal with Kyogre, while also standing up to Scarf Xerneas with ease. As a result of Ferrothorn's newfound viability, Spike's Balance became one of the most popular, powerful playstyles in the metagame, especially with how easily some of the best setup sweepers in the tier could abuse the spikes with phasing moves, such as Sub Dragon Dance, Dragon Tail, Zygarde Complete, or Calm Mind Roar Kyogre. Eventually, an Eternatus set, referred to as Demon in Turn, came into popularity. It ran Cosmic Power, Meteor Beam, Dragon Pulse, and Recover, and as the name suggests, it was an absolute monster, and continues to be viable and see usage today. But it's no longer quite as demonic. Why? Because once it has revealed to be that set, Ferrothorn would get in its way. It wasn't a hard counter or anything, as plus 6 Dragon Pulse would be too much, but the idea was that it took a long time for Eternatus to boost that high, and Ferrothorn could get in a Leech Seed and Force a Recover, or several way before that happened. Thus, even without hard countering it, Ferrothorn pretty much completely neutered one of the scariest Pokemon around, with the help of a teammate of course, but that teammate needed Ferrothorn to help it first. Eventually, the metagame started to adapt to Ferrothorn. Necrozma Dustmane started running knockoff over Thunder Wave more, neutering Ferrothorn through the loss of lefties, while Kyogre began running choice specs to potentially rip through Ferrothorn. Additionally, Hyper Offense has made a comeback, as has Geomancy Xerneas, as opposed to the Scarf and support sets that Ferrothorn easily exploited. However, in spite of all this and more, such as the rise of Ho-Oh, Ferrothorn continues to thrive and it is still absolutely elite. It remains the best non-Uber Pokemon in Ubers, and is the face of Spike stacking offense teams, enabling their aggressive Pokemon while using its Iron Defense set to provide them with defensive security against threats like Zekrom. It took a while to get going, but once again, Ferrothorn has become one of the very best Pokemon in Ubers, making it 4 for 4, just like an OU.
The initially limited metagame of Sword and Shield provided a perfect setting for Ferrothorn to wall out entire teams, as the selection of viable fire types was essentially limited to Arcanine, Rotom Heat, and Charizard. What's more, Ferrothorn fared remarkably well against threats such as Sylveon, Rhyperior, Excadrill, Whimsicott, and Togekiss. Even Dragapult had a hard time with Ferrothorn, since most VGC Dragapults are actually physically based. Ferrothorn also no longer had to worry about random hidden power fire, which, while an uncommon threat, could still easily be tacked on to handle it in prior generations. Don't get me wrong, there were still many ways to deal with it, as Conkeldur was a huge threat, as were Arcanine and Torkoal, but it was definitely harder to remove Ferrothorn than before, and it could shore up its defenses to a level that was nigh unbeatable with the aid of Dynamax boost. The advent of Dynamax meant that Ferrothorn was actually capable of boosting itself to a nigh unbeatable position with defense boost from Max Steel Spike, or it could just benefit from those of its teammates. Ferrothorn's power was immediately evident at the Bohum Regionals, where Alex Soto and Guillermo Castilla Diaz used used it to take home second and first place honors, respectively, while utilizing the standard set of Power Whip, Gyro Ball, Leech Seed, and Protect. However, come Dallas Regionals, Jake Skirchak demonstrated the potential power of one of Ferrothorn's new tools in Body Press, bringing an Assault Vest Ferrothorn to 8th place at the tournament. While Assault Vest Ferrothorn had been used before, its use here exemplified the new potential of Ferrothorn as an outright offensive threat in its own right. However, Ferrothorn's time in the sun was short-lived, actually because it didn't like the sun. While Charizard's rise in popularity made Made Ferrothorn's life hard enough, the introduction of Venusaur and the nightmare of chlorophyll boosted sleep powder skyrocketed Sun teams to the top of the meta, effectively invalidating Ferrothorn as it struggled with both additional grass type competition and tons of fire types. Now it still had some usage, shoutouts to Arashal Mahdi for giving it a 6th place finish in the Victory Road Spring Challenge, but its usage quickly dwindled. However, the constantly shifting meta of Sword and Shield actually allowed room for Ferrothorn to make its way back in. Ferrothorn actually greatly appreciated the release of Grassy Terrain Rillaboom. Not just because it liked Grassy Terrain. Actually, it was more because it absolutely destroyed Rillaboom, who was absolutely everywhere in Series 4 and 5. Ferrothorn also did well versus the very common Primarina, and while it might sound strange to say, it also handled your Shifu quite well, at least the Rapid Strikes version. Sure, close combat could tear through a Ferrothorn, but a surging strikes into Ferrothorn meant taking a hefty chunk of damage for your Shifu. And Ferrothorn had a new trick up its sleeve to handle fighting moves. Well, an old trick made new again. Although Ferrothorn had always had access to Iron Defense before, it had never had a reason to use it when it could make way for Gyro Ball or Power Whip. However, Body Press meant Iron Defense became a defensive and offensive boosting move, letting Ferrothorn boost up and 1v1 would be counters. Single Strike Yoshifu could still critical its way through defensive boost, but Rapid Strike would be doing peanuts, really taking more damage from Iron Bars more often than not. Really, it was just a great anti-meta mon in Series 5, and so it popped up everywhere in the format's most premier event so far the Players' Cup. Kyle Romanini went against the grain by using yet another Assault Vest Ferrothorn to win the Latin American qualifiers. Kyle spoke highly of Ferrothorn's ability to win games on its own by boosting, especially when paired with Porygon 2. Since max move boosts apply to both Pokemon, Ferrothorn could potentially boost both annoying tanks to unkillable levels. Kyle switched to Curse Akaberry to handle Incineroar in finals, but there were actually four other Ferrothorn users in the Players' Cup finals, and all of them used the same set. Leftovers with Body Press, Iron Defense, Leech Seed, and Protect. A moveset that could easily become too tank in a handle as special attacking threats were removed and deal huge damage while fortifying its defenses thanks to Body Press. Alistair Sandover took 13th, while Gabriel Agati and Kyle took 9th. Christopher Khan finished 6th, and Jin Sook Lee proved Ferrothorn's power with a 2nd place finish. Although his finals matchup against Santino Tarquinio's Colossal certainly wasn't the greatest place to bring a Ferrothorn. Series 7 saw Ferrothorn drop slightly in usage, while Rillaboom was still Still all the rage, Heatran was back. What's more, Amoongus' redirection skills and status became even more valuable against the many legendary Pokemon whose single target damage was hard to ignore, such as Kartana, Regilecki, and Spectrier. Amoongus also had a better matchup against Tapu Fini, who Ferrothorn could only defeat with Power Whip, an investment that denied it the ability to set up its Iron Defense, Leech Seed, Body Press set, since you always needed Protect as well. A few players brought Ferrothorn to top 8 in the Players Cup 2 qualifiers, but none of them made the cut for the final tournament, and in the Players' Cup itself, there was nary a Ferrothorn to be found. A quick look through teams at this time can reveal a big problem, and one that Ferrothorn always has to deal with these days. Incineroar is everywhere, and that dang cat just won't give it a moment's peace. Ferrothorn has actually done okay for itself in 2021, as constantly shifting metagames occasionally constrict things enough that it can make its way back in. Several players used it to good success in the single restricted meta of Series 8, including three top 8 finishes at the Women's Tournament 2, courtesy 
of Yoko, Taguma, Megan Hyman, and Scarlett Andrews. One trend that started was the use of Ferrothorn with Palkia, who could handle opposing fire types very easily and clear a path for an endgame Ferrothorn sweep. However, Series 8 was difficult for Ferrothorn in general. If you thought Sun was a problem before, imagine it with Groudon now instead of Torkoal. To be clear, Ferrothorn fared worse here than in prior restricted metas because Kyogre couldn't just fizzle fire moves completely, just dampen them, and so it still had to fear its usual counters, even if slightly less. Ferrothorn wasn't an uncommon sight at the Victory Road Circuit qualifiers, where Tehran Birdie and Manuel Berea were among the players to use it for high placements. However, it had a total of 7 top 16 placements across 5 qualifiers, and every single player used the exact same iron defense moveset, with Marcus Statter and Barris Ockles being the only players to even change the item. They went with a Guav Berry. Two players used it in the Victory Road Circuit Winter Grand Finals, like Damiano La Barbara, who placed 16th, and Matteo Agostini, who took 6th. Matty Morgan and Hippolyte Bernard both gave Farrell a top 8 placement at the EU qualifiers to Players Cup 3, but it once again missed out on the actual tournament. However, that trend would finally be broken in the very, very strange Series 9, which had the exact same rule set as 2020 Series 7. One player in particular gave Ferrothorn another Players Cup berth, Enrique Grimaldo, who won the North American qualifier and then took 5th at the Players Cup 4 finals with his team, which paired Ferrothorn with another classic Stallmon, Celestila. Juan Bor Guerrero and Yoko Taguma also put up good finishes with Ferrothorn before we switched over to Series 10, which brought back restricted Mons but with no Dynamax. Series 11 saw Wu Hing Young put up a top 4 at Taipei Regionals with Ferrothorn, but it was otherwise absent. However, Series 12 has provided an opportunity for Ferrothorn to carve out a little niche in the meta once again. Interestingly enough, a GS Cup meta with two restricted mods has suited it very well, in large part due to the fact that Zacian and Kyogre, especially in the Swordfish duel, are so strong. Ferrothorn handles Kyogre extremely well, and as for Zacian, well that's a complicated matchup. Ferrothorn's very existence forces many Zacian to run Sacred Sword instead of close combat, as otherwise an iron defense boosting Ferrothorn can just take over the game. With Sacred Sword's boosting and ignoring properties, Series 12 is nowhere near safe for Ferrothorn, but it's still a good matchup against many other restricted mods, such as Solgaleo, Ice Rider Calyrex, and Palkia. You can see from its results that it's not a frequent contender and often just misses out on top cuts, but results like Henry Rich's first place at the Brisbane Regionals and Paul Ruiz's second in an online tournament with over 500 players proves Ferrothorn still has its usage. And keep an eye out for it throughout Series 12. Restricted metagames have a tendency to adjust in small, incremental ways over the year. Sun teams may be strong now, but that's also a reaction to Swordfish. As the meta swings, it's possible Ferrothorn could leverage its good Kyogre mashup for even better results. To be honest, it's sort of admirable how little Ferrothorn has changed throughout the years. Sure, it can do body press things now, but for about 8 years, it ran pretty much the same set every time it showed up, and still gave anxiety attacks to people in Team Preview. If you don't give Ferrothorn the respect it deserves, it will outlast you. Stalwart to the end. Last Mon standing. It's a lonely job, but it's what Ferrothorn does best. And that's finally it. So how great was Ferrothorn actually? Well, that's easy. It's easily one of the greatest OU Pokemon of all time. Time and time again, it has stood up to and stifled the strongest threats in the game. And it's been not just good, but absolutely elite in both Ubers and VGC as well, as it thrives no matter what metagame it's in. And to not make this outro too long after an hour long video, we will keep it simple. Ferrothorn is simply one of the greatest Pokemon of all all time. Thank you so much for watching everyone and I greatly appreciate it if you stuck it all the way through. A lot of work went into this video but we're finally done. Again thanks for watching everyone and as always if you like the video and you want to see more be sure to subscribe to False Wipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content and in the comments I want to know what do you think about competitive Ferrothorn? How would you nerf it? This thing's too good. Whatever it is let me know in the comments and thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos and thank you to everyone else watching as well. and follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you in the next flick, everyone.